Um, all right, well, yeah, we might as well get started. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I wanna thank um, Mr. Dunn for joining us with his entire class, which is awesome. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're going to see a tour of E&J Gallo and we're gonna do a winery welding demonstration. Um, before we do get started though, I, I wanna ask um, the students that are on this to please stay muted and keep your uh, camera off. If you have a question at all, anytime throughout this whole thing, please use the raise hand function. And when there comes a time where there's a break, uh, I will I will call on you particularly to, to unmute yourself, turn your camera on and ask that question of the panelists. So feel free to raise your hand at any time. Don't feel like you're gonna bug us because we won't actually ask it until it's um, the right time to ask. Um, so, as we get started, I want to call on each of these panelists that we he have here today from E&J Gallo, one by one, and ask them to say their name and their job title so that we understand what we're looking at here. I'm gonna keep us on um, gallery view, so when it gets to that point, just kind of raise your hand and say your name. Uh, then I'll switch it over to a speaker view, so it's a little bit more um, of a focus on whoever's speaking at the time. Um, so I'm going to start out, uh, Matt, do you mind unmuting and introducing yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Matt Grau. I'm an operations team lead here at Fry Winery. And Ronnie? Yep, good morning, guys. I am Ronnie Dotson, and I am the learning and development manager for our vineyard operations. Rhonda? Good morning, guys. I am the Operations Learning and Development Program Manager for the Sonoma Region. Uh, it includes four wineries. Hey, Jonathan. I am the You're training up. and EHS Manager for the Premium Biz or for the Coastal Business Unit at Gallup. Thank you. And Gary. And Gary Vanderwerf, I'm the Maintenance Manager at uh, Winery here in Sonoma. And then we have a couple of interns that recently joined E&J Gallo. Jesus, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Jesus Hercules, uh, and I'm an intern at E&J Gallo. And Jose. Hey, good morning. My name is Jose, and I'm an intern at uh, E&J Gallo. Cool. Thank you all. Um, did I miss anybody? I think that's it, right? Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to start out by asking Matt just to give us an overview of ENJ Gallo, kind of what Gallo is um, and, and, you know, kind of maybe talk about the scale of how big Gallo is, because I, I think a lot of the students, including myself until recently, didn't realize how, how large of a company it was. Okay. Um, ENJ Gallo is the largest family owned winery in the world today. Uh, we employ more than 7,000 people worldwide, and our portfolio of products includes more than 100, 120 brands um, comprised of table wine, sparkling, luxury wines, beverage products, dessert wines, spirits. Uh, our company has products available in more than 100 countries, and we're the largest exporter of California wine. Uh, we also import wine from Argentina, France, Italy, New Zealand, and Spain. Uh, in California and Washington, we own 15 wineries. Uh, just three more got added last week with the um, acquisition of Constellation and over 23,000 acres of vineyard in California. And then here in the Sonoma region, we have three wineries. We have Asti, Fry Winery, um, and Jay Vineyards. And that's approximately like 200 people in the Sonoma, Sonoma region here. So overall, very large scale winery operation. Yeah, thank you. I think um, the thing that really stands out to me when you're talking about this, the scale of, of E&J Gallo is you guys are the largest winery in the world and you are right here in our backyard. And I think that a lot of the students would never would never know that, right? Um, but that means that when, you, you know, when you're looking at careers, the, the opportunities for growth at a company like E&J Gallo is incredible. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that because I, I think it's something special about Gallo that um, you don't really see very often. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to do was show a video, um, kind of 
going over the the life of Ian, uh, yeah, life at Ian J. Gallo. Um, I, and I think it's a really good introductory, um, you know, on top of what Matt has explained. But this is going to be a good introductory for um, what it's like to say work at, and have a career at, at Ian J. Gallo. Can you all see my screen here? Sorry, if you're nodding, I I can't see you yet. I'll just play it. Life at Gallo. Take one. Hi, my name is Sweeney. My name is Tyler. Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a senior manager in our IT department, sales planning. I work in the seller department in Modesto. I'm a ranch leader in Napa. I'm based up at our Healdsburg offices. And I've been with Gallo for six and a half years. 33 years. 21 years. And I've been with our family winery for 35 years. Gallo is a success story. It's sometimes difficult to describe. The best way that I can probably describe it, it's like a family. I feel like Gallo has a heartbeat. People really care about not only the work that we do, but about each other. Gallo is an incredibly caring community of people that are insanely driven and passionate about what they do. I think that Gallo is really a can-do organization. Gallo is authentic. The special part of Gallo is really about the people. With any good place that you work, the work is rewarding, but it's the people that make the experience. And here at Gallo, that is absolutely true. What makes Gallo great is all our bright and energetic people all pulling together to solve problems and continuously improve. I get a chance to interact and make relationships with people all over the world, just over a glass of wine. I can't complain. Gallo, in three words, I'd say. Rewarding. Inclusive. And innovative. I would probably say people, people, people. If I were to describe Gallo in three words, I'd say respect, family, and leadership. Every day I'm motivated to come to work because I think Gallo is a great company that does a lot of good things for the community. The spirit of continuous improvement is ingrained in the culture. It's a culture that uh, inspires you to give the best of you and always uh, give 100% of yourself. I feel leadership empowers all of us to come to work with an innovative mindset every day. I think passion intersects so many different elements on how we run our business. Having somebody leave with a moment that they remember from one of our properties and taking that with them for years to come is truly magical. I really think we're so lucky to have something the farmers grow and the winemakers make. When you put it in your mouth, it's wonderful. The company, the people, the family never settles for less than best in class. This organization is really unique. People really truly care about the work that they do and you can see that every day. Life at Gallup, ABC Common Slate, take one. I'm the senior brand manager of Central Innovation. I'm an on-the-job trainer. I'm a level four operator in bottling production. Vice president of wine growing. And I've been with Gallo for 17 years. For 19 years? You don't want me to do any of them over? Booyah! I'm doing spreadsheets in my normal life, so this is way more interesting. Yeah, gold star. <laughs> Hashtag thankful. Life at Gallo, that's a wrap. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Well, I, I think that, that video is just a, a really good uh, um, kind of short clip to show what it's like to, to work at Gallo. Not that we're trying to recruit all the students that are watching, that is not our purpose, but it's really important to recognize what's out there when you, you, you know, as, as high school students, you're all in that point where you're starting to, to explore careers. And uh, it's important to recognize the opportunities that are available. Um, I do also want to, touch on one thing that I know that some students are probably thinking in the back of your mind. Uh, and I'm gonna leave this up to um, Ronnie, Rhonda, or Jonathan to answer, but you know, these students here are not 21, right? The, the legal drinking age. Will you um, just quickly mention whether or not you have to be of that age to work at a place like Ian J. Gallo? Yeah, so you're struggling with mute. So as, as far as the question around being 21 to work at Gallo, you do not have to be 21 to work at Gallo. Our minimum age to work at Gallo is 18. Obviously, we do not promote drinking with, with anybody at Gallo, though. Thank you for, for um, just mentioning that, because I think it's an important question that um, whenever we're talking about jobs within the winery, students always have that question, which I think is a great question.
Next, um, we want to get into sort of a virtual tour of the uh, Fry Winery, which is up in Healdsburg, as well as um, a pretty close look at a, wi a winery welding demonstration. To start us off, um, I'm going to show a video that, that Ronnie here has, um, has filmed for us. And Ronnie, I'm going to ask you to speak over the video as we, as we see it. Yeah, sound no good. Problem. Sounds cool. good. All right, so I'm going to play it here. Um, if if anybody has any issues with uh, sound or video, please please holler, and I'll figure it out. All right, guys. So um, when I was asked to to film this, it, it's hard when you when you know our our facilities and the size of them. It's hard to really get short video and try to capture everything. Uh, what you can see here is obviously some vineyard. So our, our winery at Fry is actually in the heart of our Fry vineyard. So they're on the same property. The vineyard is uh, roughly 600 acres of what we call planted acres. So that's where there's actually vineyards um, that are planted and growing fruit for us. Um, as you head up this, this runway here, this is where our truck deliveries come that are full of grapes. Uh, these trucks come up to these hoists. Uh, this is where we actually receive the fruit off of the trucks. Um, that process is basically five ton bins or two ton bins that we dump um, over off of the truck into the receiving hoppers, which then go down into presses. What you're seeing here are all of our fermenters. So as far as red fermentation, which you see in the back, all of those tanks, we have over a hundred red fermenters. Um, this is actually within our tank farm now. And so our tank farm consists of over 200 storage vessels. Um, and those tanks can range from 600 gallons uh, to 200,000 gallons um, and everything in between. This is uh, our upper cellar, we call it. So you can see all the pipes, all of these pipes do something, right? They're either carrying nitrogen to the tanks to keep them cool. They're carrying wine from one tank to another, um, electrical, all kinds of stuff. Um, this is what our typical tanks uh, look like. So you can see they have a man door. There's usually two or three valves, sometimes more um, electrical panels. Uh, it's, it's pretty intimidating if you're not used to it. There's catwalks on top of every tank so we can access them from the top. Um, reasons for that would be to take gauges so we can tell how much liquid or wine or juice is actually in the vessel. Um, and then you can see all the different uh, valves on the tank are for different ways of moving the wine. Um, and then basically within this row, you have you know, 12 tanks or so. Um, and these are our 15,000 gallon tanks. So these are some of our smaller tanks. So this is another view at the facility. These show some of our larger tanks, uh, some of our newer uh, jacketed tanks. So this is, um, again, a, a kind of a view of how tall these tanks actually are. Um, if you're afraid of heights, it can be kind of scary up there actually. <laughs> um, very safe, handrails, guardrails, everything's safe up there, but uh, still kind of a scary sight if you don't like heights. Um, so where we're going now, this is kind of our runway that heads to uh, the heart of the winery, which is uh, our process cellar, also our maintenance shop, which I know is probably the most interesting part of all this for you guys. Um, a lot of stuff happens in the maintenance shop. You'll see when we get in there. Um, on the way, you'll notice, again, lots of pipes, lots of different tanks. Um, we'll look down one of these rows here. So again, th there's just, it's a maze of tanks. If you don't know um, exactly where you're going, you could easily get lost in all these tanks. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll start seeing uh, equipment. So this is what uh, Gary and Matt do a great job of organizing um, broken equipment and equipment that's been fixed and ready to go back out to the cellar. So you can see there's some air pumps over there, um, some different kinds of pumps. Let's see. So there's a corker, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, this, is, this is a common site for the winery. They, they are using this equipment 24 hours a day. We work around the clock. Um, and so equipment is constantly needing repair. And that's a big part of what the maintenance department does. Um, you'll notice once we get in here, this is our main shop for the Fry Winery. Um, you can see it's well kept. Uh, there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of parts. I mean, it's pretty insane when you get in there, um, looking at all of the stuff that they actually use on a daily basis. This is their welding area. 
Uh, there's their welding screen. So as we go around, you'll notice different parts, right? Here's, here's Al. Al's uh, been with the winery for quite a while. He's getting some stuff ready to, to deliver. You can see Kelly in the back back there. He's working on the lathe, manufacturing some parts and fabricating. Um, it's, a, it's a busy place. There's always a couple of mechanics in here working on different projects uh, while the rest are actually out on the floor helping the winery guys uh, either fix something or build something. Uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna give a second to see if we have anyone who uh, is, any of the, the students have a, has a question, use the raise hand function and I, uh, I'm keeping an eye on it right now and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, in the meantime, I, I wanted to ask you, Ronnie, just what kind of, what kind of skills would you say are, are needed by somebody to work within the uh, maintenance shop there? Uh, I would defer to Gary or deflect, if you will. Um, he is the one that runs that shop and he knows it very well. Yeah. Uh, we have requirements uh, that, that they say that you need two or three years of, uh, of apprenticeship or uh, maintenance work in a high-speed uh, winery or bottling line. The reason we're doing this whole experiment here is because finding people with that kind of experience aren't around. So uh, young people that are coming out of school, I know Jose and, and uh, Juan spent six weeks with us and uh, we're looking at spending some more time with us. Uh, you need to have some mechanical ability, you need to have some uh, troubleshooting ideas and you need to, you need to be open to, to learning on the job and uh, be willing to accept when you've made a mistake and figure out that you can learn from making mistakes. And uh, usually maintenance folks are more than happy to share all their experience with you. And, and uh, uh, some of it's good and some of it's just plain not worth listening to. But by and large, we're, we're, try we're trying to involve young people into getting into, in, into the maintenance industry for wineries or food processing or any of those things. It's, it's been very good to me, so I, uh, I would invite everybody to listen up and pay attention and if they have any questions later you can get uh, my information from the from the folks that are leading this project okay another quick question and this is for whoever whomever wants to answer but to join say the maintenance shop is there a specific education that's needed or can someone come pretty fresh out of high school or you know what, what are you looking at there again there uh there, there is no criteria. There's some great courses at the junior college of, uh, uh, for, to get you the fundamentals that you need. Uh, we're, we're, we're lacking in apprenticeship programs in this country period. So uh, getting, getting somebody to go in that direction, it has, just has to be uh, inspired by the school systems and, and, uh, and the maintenance departments around when you get somebody to inspire them to want to do the job. It's, it's, you know you have the ability going in because it's something that interests you. The rest of it, you just need to have the patience and, uh, and, and the willingness to learn and, and, and listen to the folks around you and follow those, those trails. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, Gary, I'm gonna ask you actually to um, narrate this next part of the video, which is the, the welding demonstration. So. Sure, go ahead. So what we're going to demonstrate here is uh, sanitary weld on 304 stainless steel tubing uh, using a, a TIG setup with a argon purge. We want, to, uh, we want to make sure that the finished weld is sanitary both inside and out, that we have no oxidation or anything. So we'll tack it up, uh, the two pieces together. Uh, then we'll set it up so we can put a, a, an argon purge to the inside of the tank, inside of the parts as we're welding them up. Our welder here is uh, actually a Petaluma alumni, Brad Manson, I believe back 10 or 20 years ago was uh, a graduate of Petaluma High School. So he was excited about doing this. Uh, so what, what we're doing is setting up the piece. He's tacked it together. We're setting the piece up so we can uh, trap the argon in, in, the, uh, in the part itself. 
We'll pop off all the ends. He'll poke a bunch of holes in it so we can stick a argon purging tube in, set it up in our turntable, uh, and uh, start start uh, start the weld. I'll let you watch what he's doing, and we'll take a have a conversation afterwards when he's done. He's almost he's almost to the point where he's getting ready to set it up. This is his favorite part of the job right here. So this is a little slow speed uh, turntable. We're, we're using, a, again, a TIG setup with uh, an argon uh, uh, gas purge and an and a argon gas cover on the, on the tungsten uh, weld, uh, weld element that we're using on the torch. The material is 304 stainless tubing. It's uh, 065 wall, so it's about a 16th of an inch thick. You have to re regulate your amperage and your temperature so you don't end up blowing holes through, uh, <coughs> through the material. He's using this uh, little uh, aluminum block set up here to steady his hand because we want to keep the weld as contained and neat as possible. And uh, we'll, he'll get started here in just, just a second. You see the slow rotation of the part. He's got to put his purge tube in and uh, then we'll strike an arc and finish this up quickly. This argon tube is just, just off a small regulator off the same tank that you're supplying for the torch itself. It's a, it's a standard setup in, uh, in sanitary uh, welding and sanitary piping that uh, is not, it's common just about every food plant, dairy, winery, soda plant that uh, it's, that's out there. Here we go, set an arc. We wanna do this in one continuous weld. We don't wanna pull away from the weld because every place that you pull away and start again, you have a, you have a penetration or a weak spot that can uh, harbor Harbor bacteria and uh, make it an inferior weld. Again, what, uh, arc welding, TIG welding, especially sanitary. It, it uh, at the end of the day, it's an art form. You get to, you get to a point where it is second nature to you, and and it uh, if. <laughs> There's some people that's all they want to do is just be fitters and welders, and there's some people that uh, just just don't want to get near a, a TIG setup because it scares the hell out of them. We're almost there. I think we're what half the way around. Again, this is a piece of two inch material, so you're looking at almost uh, six and a half inches, almost seven inches of weld around the circumference of this. So you have to be, be patient and uh, make, make sure you, you're coloring within the lines and make uh, were, leave, you, leave the gas on for a minute to cool your weld. And we've got a, uh, got a completed sanitary weld. Just a minute, we'll clean it up and you can take a look and see what the inside looks like. The inside of this weld should look exactly like the outside of the weld. Any discoloration on the inside, if it's if it's other than just this nice blue color, if you get any reds or oranges are in there, that you've got some oxidation and you didn't do a good job job purging your purging the uh, the weld itself. So you notice the inside, nice and blue and cleaned up. It looks exactly like the outside. That is a that is a professional weld. He'll clean it up for you real quick, and you can see what the finished product looks like. Little Scotch Bright uh, pad there, just uh, clean the the residue off, and uh, 
there you have it. Once once it's installed, we would run a, a passivation process through the, all the installation and uh, you have a sanitary weld. Wow, that's really cool. One, one question that I have actually is you were talking about, um, you know, the measure of the circumference and, and it made me think, is there a, is there a need to have a, a good grasp on math and algebra in order to be in the maintenance shop? You're on, you're on mute. You, you need to be able to, to think mathematically. You need to, to uh, have some algebra skills, some geometry skills, and, uh, and to, to be able to think linearly just about all the things that are involved with. You, you're, you're dealing with ratios on gearboxes and, and uh, just it's an everyday, it's an everyday problem that you're going to be doing some math somewhere down the line, be it in the electronics, the electrical, fabrication, any of those things. Okay, good. So I'm going to take this time now to look to the students here. I'd like to have you guys pop in and ask any questions that you may have. Um, if you want to show yourself, uh, you're welcome to write it into the chat function and I can ask it. But otherwise, you're welcome to unmute and turn your camera on and, and ask the question. I'm not seeing any raised hands at the moment. Um, I might ask uh, Mr. Dunn to, to see if you have any questions, just based on how this aligns with what you're teaching in the class. Um, do you have any questions? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I guess for the folks at Gallo, just so you have kind of a grasp of where my students are coming from, uh, these kids are in my uh, advanced welding class. And unfortunately, due to circumstances, this year they haven't actually been able to do any welding at all. Um, but most of their background is in uh, oxy fuel, uh, MIG welding, and uh, sheet metal arc, or uh, shielded metal arc welding. Arc welding. Um, so this year would have been the year that they would have uh, done their TIG welding. Um, but what other welding processes do you guys use, uh, on a fairly regular basis within the winery? Uh, we, we've got a, we've got a MIG set up, which, uh, is, you know, it, it's great for mild steel and maybe structural, uh, stainless. If you got uh, a lot of, a lot of setup and runs to do by and large, uh, our fabricators are, uh, they like to, they like to use the TIG rig. They like to, uh, uh, use the, use filling rod, fill rod for, for the big projects. It just makes, it makes a really nice sanitary weld. MIG, MIG's all right, but it, it's just not, it's just not as elegant and, and uh, pristine when you get done. And what we're, lo what we're looking for is, is uh, as I uh, instruct, tell my guys, uh, every one of my guys is the Perception is 90% of reality and what it looks like when you get done is what you want to be remembered by because they're not, it's not going to be anything else than who did that job and it looks like good or it looks like crap. And we, 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 we want good. We, we want to be praised for the, uh, the presentation and what, what we're doing. We're a professional operation. We want to maintain those, those standards. When you're done with a weld, um, assuming, you know, liquid or gas is going to go through that, do you have to hook it up to something to test the weld to make sure it's sealed properly? Do you do that? Uh, on a on a on a new installation, uh, yes, we'll we'll put uh, we'll we'll create a loop and we'll put a pressure gauge on it. We'll pressurize the system to 150, 200 pounds, depending on what we're gonna what we're gonna be pumping through it, and uh, set it up, valve it off, and let it sit for 24 hours to make sure that we're not losing any pressure anywhere. And that's that's a, a pretty fair fair test. Uh, repair work, you have to, you have to depend on your ability to do a, do a, a good job. And when you turn things back on, you need to check where you were working and make sure that you have completed the task. It's otherwise, otherwise it's, uh, it's just more work for the next guy. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Brandon, can I jump in? I just one yeah. more question. Um, it seems like by looking at the shop, it's not set up just welding. And so, as a job position with with Gallo, is it 
a maintenance mechanic? And are you expected to do multiple, have a little bit of knowledge on motors, pumps, welding, um, electricity, and kind of jack of all trades? Or do you have specific uh, employees that are just welders and that's what they specialize in? The the industry, and I've, I've been in the industry for a number of years, has always tended to have a jack of all trades and have a, a specialty or a couple specialties that that you excel in. In, in uh, Brad's case, he's a he's an excellent fabricator, but if I needed to, I could send him into the bottling room to do some to do some maintenance and PM work on the bottling equipment, also pump rebuilds, and and things like that. He has. They all, they all have to have some experience in, in machining, basic machine tool operations, mill and lathe, uh, electrical troubleshooting, uh, motor winding, understanding how to re, uh, change the uh, rotation of a three-phase motor, which is pretty simple, but it's, it's also nice to learn. You feel fulfilled when you do that. The only place that I would say that you need to really put some expertise if that's what you wanted to do would be in the PLC, the programmable logic controllers that we're seeing throughout the throughout uh, industry. Every, every, you, you've got small PLCs in your house on your irrigation timers and things like that. It's, it's the same process. So uh, there's, there's some in-depth coursework at the junior college that, uh, that they can follow, but it, um, you, you need you need to be good at a lot of things and really good at one or two. You know, just to, to touch on the PLCs, the program logic controls, we had an activity in December that was focused on automation and, and sort of the future of work. And, and if anybody's interested in, in learning more about PLCs and how that's becoming, um, you know, more and more standard, uh, that there's a video on our um, virtual career connected learning webpage on the CTE Foundation webpage uh, website um, that that goes into depth on that. So I'd highly recommend it. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Gary, thank you so much for all your in info. Um, I want to jump over to um, Jose and Jesus because you both ha uh, are, are recently graduated high school. Uh, what in last year, and have been doing a internship at ENJ Gallo since what was it August or so, something like that. And so I want I had some questions for you because I'd I'd love to get your your thoughts on some things. Mainly, um, first and foremost, I just want to know from your perspective what it's like to jump into the not only the wine industry but particularly the particularly on the maintenance side of it. Maybe you can give your thoughts about what that was like to come kind of right out of high school and do that. Uh, well, on my end, it was pretty interesting just because, you know, you're right out of high school and you're entering a career where a lot of people like you need, you need to, uh, as Gary said, you, there's classes at the JC that you need to take in order, you know, to, to learn these skills and to learn at like the hands of these people who have been doing it for a few years now. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's, you could say it's kind of intimidating too, just because of all the machinery that's there that's needed to use to be used in order to like repair a machine or, or anything like that. But it's it's uh, it's been pretty interesting. It's been pretty fun so far, learning new things and being able to say, hey, I was able to repair that, or hey, I'm able to fix this, and hey, I'm able to take this entire machine apart and put it back together and have it working again. So on my end, it's been pretty interesting. Uh, well, hey, my on my end, it's uh. It has been pretty interesting too, because like Jesus said, uh, we come right out of high school, high school, and then we started working with uh, with a, with people that have a lot of experience in the maintenance right now. So we get to work with a with a lot of people that already have like a degree on on a, on a specialty, and, uh, and but yeah, it has been really interesting so far. What's one thing that surprised you both when you joined the industry that you you know you either didn't think about or something that you really was like oh wow I didn't realize how much I liked doing that one thing. Um, uh, there were some things where like I haven't uh, been able to get my hands on yet, and that'll probably be like the PLC that uh, Gary mentioned earlier because uh, you know it's programming and I've been interested in programming for a while. Uh, that's something that caught my eye. Um, 
Another thing, uh, one thing that did surprise me was just, um, I guess, the amount of time um, some projects take. Uh, when we were here in the beginning, uh, one individual, Perry, who's a maintenance, had been here for quite a while from what I hear. Um, he was working on a project that took him, I think, around like uh, four or four weeks. But he was able to uh, fix this. Um, it was kind of a, it's, it's like, um, it elevates and um, it elevates like pallets. So when you're putting them into uh, the bottling line, so uh, that's some, something that surprised me. You're just like, well, they can. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of patience. So and the amount of patience that he had to fix the the machine was uh, it was it was surprising to me uh, that he had. Um, and on my end, it's uh, what surprised me the most is all the work that it takes to to um to get that wine into a bottle just to get that wine into a bottle because there's a lot of procedures like it goes since uh, the vineyards to to like to um to the press to the pressers I think mm -hmm. it's called and then you you have to ferment uh, ferment uh, let the fruit ferment and then it, it just takes a lot of work to get to that bottle. And that's something that has uh, that I never thought about it since I started working here. And yeah. Um, and to add on to that, it's like not only uh, have we been going into the maintenance, we've been going into other departments. So we can also see like the different work it takes to put that wine into the bottle. Like he said, we see what they do in the vineyard side. We see what they do in the maintenance side. We see what they do in the production side. So it's, it's 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 a lot uh, to take in, but in the end, it's it's very satisfying to learn. Now, have you both learned to weld while you're there? Uh, well, I I I had a little project for a couple of days, and it was it was really interesting. I I really liked it. I wish I had a, like more a little bit more time to practice more, but it was it was something good. Um. Do you is that something that you're gonna kind of continue on as a little bit more of a focus going forward? Is is the welding piece? Yeah, uh, yeah, I would like to try in the future, like take some classes for welding. But yeah. Um, well, that actually brings me to my next question. You're, you're mentioning welding classes. What are your plans? So you guys just you, you guys jumped into this internship out of high school, but what are your plans? Uh, for for post secondary education, you mentioned you're, you're going to take some welding classes. Um, anything else, Jose? Uh, well, I'm kind of interested in welding, also like in uh, ele electricity and mechanics. So I'll go like for a certificate on that. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, like the other thing, um, it's. Uh, for my secondary education, I feel like I would pursue uh, something like in this field, like welding. It does like it seems interesting. It catches, it catches my eye. You know, you're able to fuse two pieces of metal together and make it stronger and more durable. Um, and then also you can apply like the Gary had mentioned in the past about some classes you can take at the JC in order to and um, at the JC. So uh, I want to take those classes, you know, in mechanics, because not only can you apply it here, you can also apply it in other fields. Uh, you can also, you know, be able to learn some trades, be able to, you know, fix your car in the future, uh, rather than take it to like a mechanic and, you know, um, you know, uh, pay more money than you could have while fixing it. So I'm going to give, once again, the uh, students that are watching the opportunity to either uh, unmute and, and turn your mic on and ask a question of Jesus and Jose or anybody else that we've heard from, um, or you're, you can type it in the chat if you uh, would prefer to do it that way. Okay. Well, I am not seeing any. Okay, well then, <laughs> then we'll just end it there. Uh, I, I, I wanna thank Mr. Dunn and all the students. I mean, it looks like we've got um, almost 20 students here that joined us today. So thank you all for being here. I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned a lot. 
not only about welding, but just overall careers within maintenance and machining um, that you might be able to find in, in the wine industry. Because that's something that a lot of people might not even know is there. They think of wine and they kind of more think of the front facing side of, of the wine industry, you know, like a, a tasting room or something like that. But um, there's a lot more there. And, and it's if you're into, if you're more of a hands-on person, if you're into welding, or um, you know the program logic control side of it, automation. There are so many opportunities for you. Um, so I'm going to just say thank you to all of our panelists: Ronnie, Gary, Matt, Rhonda, Jonathan, um, and then Jesus and Jose. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm starting to see I'm starting to see some questions come through now. So actually, if you if you don't mind, I, I might as well end it with those. Um, what are the salary and benefits that you offer? I, well, so that, that question is probably going to be complicated because it depends on the job. But like, let's say, um, I don't know if that's something that the HR folks in, in, can answer here. Jonathan, you want to answer maybe what the starting looks like? Yeah, so, um, so starting salary, which is in a salary for a maintenance assistant or apprentice is around $22 an hour, about $22.50 an hour. For an internship role, they're around $18 an hour currently, which is about average across the industry within Sonoma County in general. Um, and, and that's where it starts. So it's it's obviously full-time work with full-time benefits, PTO, healthcare, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, e and Gallo prides itself in its um, investing and, and retirement programs and stuff like that. So there's there's additionally some stuff like that. But that's for salary. And then I think the second question was around further, how do we support education? So it, it's different and it depends on the role. You've heard these guys mention that they're going to pursue their education as well. Gallo does support furthered education as long as it fits within your role and goes towards your, your, your future, right? So maintenance, obviously we'd support further education and maintenance. I have a couple members on my team who are going after their MBAs right now. And we support that as well, because that's in line with uh, where they're going with their career at Gallo. So we do support education. It takes some steps to get there. Additionally, a lot of people also take additional education opportunities on their own. So right now I'm, I'm pursuing some education through uh, a, an online school in analytics and stuff like that, but that's, that's on my own, but it is to support my career and, go down those different paths. So there's multiple ways uh, that we do support education and things like that. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and then uh, just, it looks like it was uh, showing Ronnie since I think you're on Ronnie's audio there. It showed Ronnie talking. <laughs> it looked like Ronnie was saying the whole thing. Just take, just take credit for it, Ronnie. I probably look really good with an uh, Arkansas accent. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank you all again. I'm not seeing any other questions, uh, but we are right about on time where we wanna be. So uh, I will say that, and um, we really appreciate it. If you have any other questions as far as, uh, I'm talking to the students now, if you have any other questions about these careers, just talk to Mr. Dunn and he can reach out to me and we can uh, you know, discuss exploring internships within Gallo or anything like that. Okay, thank you all. Excellent, thank you.